adjust your dial. We are here to bug you on purpose. Today on the county seat, we're going to talk about something that is as scary as Halloween, and it's the appropriate season to talk about it. It is an invasion that potentially could be coming your way. Can we stem it? That's what this show's about. We are actually talking about pest in invasions. We are talking about invasive species and a quarantine to try to stop it. Let's give you a little background information with our story. One of the best comforts while camping in the woods is a warm, cozy fire. While we enjoy the fire, we also take great care that it doesn't get out of hand and start burning the forest. Smokey's advice, only you can prevent forest fires, is right there to remind us. However, there is another threat to the forest that may have found its way there with your firewood. The Utah Department of Agriculture and Food has issued a wood quarantine in an effort to protect Utah from invasive bug species. An invasive species is a non-native organism that is capable of harming the economy, environment, and human health. While there are a number of these species, the bug that the ag and food is particularly worried about right now is the emerald ash borer. And while it hasn't hit Utah yet, local officials aren't taking chances. We didn't believe it would actually get to Utah because there's not a contiguous amount of ash from the east to the west. However, it did end up in Colorado and Boulder, and that's one of our big concerns now is that it got introduced there probably through firewood. This tiny green-skinned bug is piggybacking its way across the country in a few ways but one common way is via cords of wood sold at stores across the country. To prevent its arrival in Utah, consumers need to be careful. What people need to do um, is really, when they're purchasing firewood, make sure that that wood has, is, has a label on it stating where that wood has come from. We don't want those pests to get settled, situated in Utah, get settled here, get established. Invasive species like the emerald ash borer aren't anything new to Utah. A few years ago, Utah County had a problem with Japanese beetles, and it cost the state more than a million dollars to eradicate the problem, but the cost wasn't just in cash. And however, it cost the homeowners quite a bit too. We had asked them not to grow gardens because some of the pesticides that we were using, they shouldn't be consuming. They weren't approved for use in a garden. But we wanted to make sure that we could get rid of that beetle, and those people down there were willing to sacrifice that so that we could get rid of it. If Utahns don't help to prevent the spread of this invasive species, the cost will stack up even beyond the dead trees and eradication costs. A lot of our counties, and rural counties, grow nursery stock to ship out of state or even ship in state. If they were shipping ash trees and that county got emerald ash borer, we would have to quarantine those and they would then not be able to sell those to other places. We'll discuss further ways you can help prevent the spread of invasive species in our panel discussion. For the county seat, I'm Joe Davis. Well, there you have the background, and it is a serious topic, so the fun stops here. We'll be back after a commercial break. We'll talk about this quarantine and what you can do to be a part of it. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil vale Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. Crisp, colorful, a world in transition. You don't have to travel the back roads of Maine to explore autumn in all of its glory. Beaver County offers fall in unique splendor, with drives along forgotten canyons and hikes through meadows exploding with vibrant hues of red and yellow. Hit the road with your family and discover a side of Beaver County you never knew you were missing. Autumn is fleeting, so don't hesitate. Beaver County, it's time to experience the real Utah. I'll tell you, this is one great state, but it hasn't been a walk in the park. I mean, they call me invasive species. Nice, huh? Or hungry pests. Like I'm some kind of bad guy or something. I mean, do I look invasive? No. You should think of me as a culinary tourist. Yeah, I'm sort of a footloose foodie of your fields and trees. I just want to sample the local fare. Just a taste, really. And I'm not the pushy type. People help me get around, mostly on the things they move and pack. 
Did you know I'm completely vegetarian? Yeah, very healthy. Hungry pests. Oh, gotta run. I do have a lot of mouths to feed. The truth is, hungry pests threaten to devour our trees and agriculture. It's up to each of us to learn to leave hungry pests behind. Go to HungryPests.com and get the facts. A message from the USDA. Come on! See what I mean? Welcome back to the county seat. Our conversation today about invasive species in Utah. Well, obviously, we start with a little bit of a lighthearted approach about a very serious problem, but uh, the scope of it uh, should be pretty relevant and, and, and evident by now. Joining us for our conversation, Don Holzer from the USDA. We have Ryan Davis from the US, USU Extension Service and from the Department of Ag and Food, the Mr. Pest himself, Chris Watson. How are you? Well, thank you, Jay. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you all taking the time to come out and, and talk about this. So we see that firewood's a, a specific problem for invasive species, but I sat and looked at some of the promos that the USDA has uh, prepared to tell people about them, and it looked like there are a lot of ways for invasive species to wander into the state. Uh, what are some of the other pathways people should be watching before we hone in on, on firewood quarantine? Yeah, Chad, there's many different pathways that invasive pests uh, make it to Utah mm -hmm. or throughout the states and this is just firewood is just one of them there's also outdoor household articles uh, different insects are able to put their egg masses or attach themselves to lawn furniture uh, different equipment playground equipment that type of thing to bring that when they move from another state into Utah and that's a concern to us there's also nursery stock which we do nursery inspections throughout the state which is also a major pathway for these invasive pests. But they don't like hiding the wheel well of an airplane or your car or anything and when you go on vacation? We've anything? actually seen uh, where they have had egg masses attached to wheel wells. So really? It could, could happen. Wow. I mean, yeah, pests are really good hitchhikers, right? So they, they could be on anything. We even, and, and thinking of pests, it's not just insects that we're concerned about. It could be things like weed and weed seed sticking to your boots if you go out hiking. So. so let's talk a little bit about the quarantine specifically on firewood. Why did we choose that and, 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 and focus on that as, a, as in, you know, a key issue in this battle? Yeah, firewood is just a major pathway. It's one pathway that we feel at the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food that we're able to regulate. And being that it, wood borers and different insects are able to actually attach either to the outside of the wood or inside of the wood and you may never even know that the insect was there and then that pathway people like to bring their firewood with them to go camping the state of utah is great for camping we love our recreation and people like to visit the great state of utah and so they're able to uh, bring their firewood and we would just like to be able to regulate that and make sure that they're not bringing invasive pests with them so i guess my first question is for the years that people have been watching our show and the many times we've talked about the the forests in the state of Utah with the pine bark beetle. Is it possible that, that the Dixie National Forest problem today started by some uh, unsuspecting camper several years ago? Well, actually those, those species were native to Utah already. And so it was actually stand conditions which allowed spruce beetle to erupt and which allowed mountain pine beetle to erupt. So th those were things that were already here. Um, still invasive in the way that they acted, um, but not an introduced species. Okay. Um, so what should people be looking for as, as far as firewood goes? You, you, how does a quarantine work? You just, you're just saying no outside wood, you got to buy your wood here? Because that makes people think like I'm in a movie theater and I've got to buy your popcorn. Yeah, well, essentially there's already a firewood quarantine from these federally quarantined areas. You cannot br bring this regulated article, firewood, into the state of Utah. It's just one way for us to be able to regulate this is if it is labeled. So I've identified that in many cases there's not a label on the firewood and therefore it makes it very difficult for us to be able to regulate that. So are we ever gonna reach a point where we have agricultural inspection stations coming into Utah and instead of looking at apples and oranges, we're gonna be looking for firewood and, and, well, and playground sets? Chad, you hit right on, this is essentially what California is doing except for they have the agriculture border stations that they're able to uh, inspect before the commodity reaches their state. And so this is one of our tools in order to uh, 
mitigate for pests. So really quickly, I don't see any evidence of a quarantine. What does it actually look like to us? How does it function? Well, this will be implemented through labeling and where most consumers will be able to see a label on there that indicates that it's been heat treated, where its place of origin is from, and actual contact information. This will allow us to be able to look at the label and then contact the individual if there's any problems with uh, quarantine issues. All right, excellent, great place to take a break. I wanna look at this in a little bit broader picture when we come back. We'll return to the county seat in just a minute. There is a place where looking out means looking in, where an impression lasting only a few seconds will be imprinted on a life forever, where courage is forged and innocence rediscovered, where remembering is rewarding and forgetting unforgettable. There is a place where truth is felt and where seeing is believing. There is a place. TV, check. Four wheel driving, check. Bouldering, check. Mountain biking, check. Hiking, check. River rafting, check. Adventure is about more than just crossing activities off of a list, but hey, if you can find a place that gives you everything you're looking for, all the better. In Emory County, you'll find the San Rafael Swell, trails, lakes, and the small town hospitality you're looking for. San Rafael Country, in the heart of Utah. Visit us and check something off your list. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today about a firewood quarantine and the important part that watching our wood supply and other agriculture supplies has in our own agricultural health. Okay, so I, I wanna follow up with a question because this kind of came up as a thought during the break. Uh, people are hearing about wood quarantine. You gotta have a label, stuff's gotta be inspected. Does that mean that I can't go to the Forest Service or the BLM and get a wood cutting permit and go up into the hills uh, around Salt Lake or where I live in Utah and cut down wood anymore? Yeah, that's a good point, Chad. I appreciate you bringing that up. That's, uh, this essentially quarantine is exempt for anybody harvesting firewood locally within the state. So any, any firewood harvested- Within the state. Within the state. So if I live in Green River and I go over the border to Colorado, that's where I don't cut firewood. Has potential to be just, a problem. I just look yes. for the little red line that's the borderline in the state and make sure it's on our side. As written, yes. Okay, there we go. Uh, I, I did, but see, see, that raises a really good point. This is just, I mean, we're looking at it as a Utah problem, but this is a bigger problem because I imagine Colorado or Wyoming or Idaho are probably trying to do the same thing. How does that fit in in an interstate basis? Yeah, in several cases, I think maybe even Don would be able to answer on some of these questions just with the federal quarantines and how they are implementing the same concerns with firewood uh, moving throughout the... Yeah, how do, you, how do you manage that on a federal level? It just seems, it seems overwhelming. Well, we have the authority under the Plant Protection Act of 2000, was revised then, uh, to have numerous different domestic quarantine areas for different regulated pests. And the purpose of those is to contain those infested areas where they already occur and protect places like Utah from getting these new invasive pests into the areas. So for example, emerald ash borer uh, is a huge new invasive pest that's already attacking, I think it's in 31 different states right now, mostly throughout the east and the Midwest. It's also in Colorado now. Boulder County, Colorado is a quarantine area. So there is a firewood quarantine, it is illegal to move all types of firewood out of those areas into uninfested areas. So that's just one example. So, so 
I, I guess that raises a question. Can you, it almost sounds like you're trying to slow the flow, but. Exactly, but we call it, um, yeah, what do we call it? Slow the spread. Okay, I didn't mean to borrow somebody from our water conservancy friends, but, <laughs> it, it, but, it, but it sounds like this is really a hard problem and that eventually this is gonna get us in the, nip us in the bud, no pun intended, uh, in the first place. Is, is that true or? Well, it, it really depends um, how much people are willing to help out and comply. Uh, as another example, uh, gypsy moth uh, occupies a similar territory as emerald ash borer does right now. But it's been in the U.S. since 1869. Uh, early on in my career with USDA in 1988, it was detected here in Utah for the first time. I remember that. I was there too. I think Larry <laughs> Lewis was as well. So a lot of us were involved in that. And we spent the better part of 10 years and over $5 million eradicating that successfully from Utah, which is pretty amazing that we were able to do that. It was in a four county area. At our largest time, we sprayed just under 50 square miles. And that went on for most of, most of 10 years. But we did it, we got rid of it. So gypsy moth is an example where if you hold that line, you can keep it from getting into other areas. So did we reach a point where we had eradicated it enough that we, didn't, that we don't have to do ongoing treatment to protect We're not doing it? ongoing treatment. However, we do continue monitoring and surveying. And that's a, a big part of our regular everyday jobs that Chris and Ryan and myself do is survey in the state. So we continue to look for it and we continue to educate people to be on the lookout for it and ask them not to move outdoor household articles from those regulated areas that could have uh, invasive species on them. So if you're moving, you gotta leave your swing set where you live? Do you there's have to actually, buy a new one? There's actually an online checklist. You can go on our website and there's a, a self-certification that you can do. Uh, you're actually supposed to have this documentation with you in your moving van if you move from a gypsy moth infested area to somewhere that's not infected like Utah. Or an ash borer area or any of these other. So, so like with quagga mussels, there's, there's a procedure you can Very go similar. through to decontaminate. You can do that with, so you don't have to leave your swing set if you that's decontaminate That's correct. It. You can scrape the egg masses off. You look for life stages and the website shows you exactly what to look for. And you can actually scrape those egg masses off into a pail of soapy water and your equipment is good to go oh, once okay. it's clean. So uh, this is a question for you, Ryan. Okay. All right, how many ash borer uh, bugs does it take to start an infestation? Start an infestation? I mean, theoretically one um, pregnant female, let's say, um, could get into trees and start laying eggs and then you have an infestation. Likely before something becomes a problem. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to impress how vigilant people actually have to be. How vigilant do they have to be to keep something from, that we don't have from? They have to be very vigilant in terms of, you know, where they're harvesting their wood and where they're taking it. Obviously anything from a quarantine area you don't want to bring into the state. And now you don't want to bring anything from out of state. Um, yeah. One thing that I'd just like to point out is that this is not saying that you can't bring it in. It's just saying that you need to communicate with the Department of Agriculture and ensure that you're not in a quarantine area. There's also exemptions that we're able to write so that you're able to bring these, that firewood, or as Don mentioned, outdoor household articles into the state. We're not saying that you can't. It's just there's certain treatment options that you need to follow to be able to comply. So is this kind of, is this going to be kind of an ongoing thing? I mean. We do have a history of invasive pests, um, obviously, because we're talking about gypsy moth, and, and we've had several, but is this just a new fact of life about the growing populations and a more migrant population that all the states are going to have to do this kind of thing forever just to keep things contained? Yes, I think that's part of it. That's an accurate description that, yeah, because of our increased rate of travel, we are at higher risk. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're actually here today is because outreach becomes a more and more impor important part of what we all do every day, uh, trying to get the general public to uh, be on the lookout for these pets as well and educate them. Uh, just to kind of look at a historical aspect, um, how far back can you track bug infestations and, 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 and problems that have developed? Oh, I've, I've got some uh, figures here that I wrote down. Uh, going back way to the beginning of the century, actually, uh, boll weevil came in in the early 1900s into the U.S. I was not there for no, that I one. Wasn't. <laughs> okay. Gypsy moth I mentioned was 1869. Chestnut blight, 1904. Dutch elm disease, 1930. Imported fire ant, 1913 and 1930s. And we've had some others more recent like emerald ash borer getting into the U.S. in 2003. 
So um, are all of these threatening, I mean, people are probably thinking forest right now because of pine bark beetle and, and, and we hear ash beetle and we go, oh, ash is a tree. And I think, well, that's a, that's a forest, that's an in the mountains problem. Are some of these actual city problems or urban problems? Uh, definitely are. Um, if we look at, in particular, emerald ash borer, uh, in the east it does affect forest trees, but also street trees. I mean, we're looking at nearly 100% kill of all ash trees. And so if you think about that insect coming to Utah and being successful, uh, we're losing, I think Chris said, anywhere from 5 to 80% of our urban forests, just depending on where you are in the state. And that's just to, city. To the ash borer currently? That, if it comes to the state, that's and establishes, yes. What, what do we have right now that, that is killing trees or, or, or killing any kind of agriculture in an urban setting? Just somebody want to take a stab at that one? Uh, I mean, there are a whole host of pests, you know, non-invasive or things that are potentially invasive. But, um, yeah, I mean, we have all, all types of things, like, like you mentioned on the Dixie and up at high elevation, mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle killing trees. What about in the in urban federal heights? <laughs> federal heights. Um, well, I mentioned weeds. A lot of rangeland weeds, weeds get their start yeah. in uh, landscape settings. Okay, so I mean, it is a broad problem. Absolutely. All right, well, this has been a very interesting conversation. I probably have more questions than answers, but we're going to take a, uh, a quick break. When we come back, we're kind of trying to sum this all up and give an action plan for you, the viewer at home. We'll be right back with the county seat in just a minute. There's a little place on a Utah map Where I was raised, where my heart's at Where the sagebrush grows wild and high And the stars come out at night Oh, there ain't nothing like Being raised in the basin with a youth reservation Skin starvation, that Duchesne County life the Utah Farm Bureau began as a collection of farmers supporting each other to raise the food we enjoy. Today, Farm Bureau membership encompasses everyone, whether ranchers, growers, or just everyday folks like you and me. Members enjoy discounts on items like vehicles and ATVs, or insurance that's very affordable. You don't have to be a farmer to join, and dues are small, but together we make a big difference in keeping our food supply local and abundant. Join Utah Farm Bureau. Mall offers more than just shopping. Bring the whole family and enjoy Sequest Interactive Aquarium to feed the fish and exotic birds, hold live reptiles, and even swim with the stingrays. Or pump up the action and visit Dartside, Utah's premier soft foam dart tag arena. And don't forget the Great Room Escape where you can challenge your friends to solving mysteries inside themed rooms. So come and experience great fun at the Leighton Hills Mall and visit playindavis.com for other great activities. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about invasive species. We are talking about quarantines and things that the Department of Ag and Food, working in conjunction with the federal government, are doing to try to make sure that our forests, our lawns, our trees, and our yards stay healthy. What defines an invasive species? I think that's something that I we... think it's very important to define what it is because there are a lot of exotic species that come into this into the country. In fact, it's estimated some 50,000 species have been brought in over the years. Um, but what an invasive species is, is it is a non-native species that actually causes harm. And it can cause harm to the environment, to the economy, human health, et cetera. So that's the important designation there, is that it does cause harm. Okay, not that it's just a, a nuisance and a different right. kind of butterfly yeah, flying around I mean, in the yard. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of invasive species, right? I mean, dandelions, we all deal with those. Um, your earwigs, you know, European earwigs, European paper wasps, house mice. Oh, those can cause they're a all lot invasive, of harm. I've right? been stung by them before. <laughs> they're not very pleasant, right. but, I, but I do get your point. Uh, so 
I think that we need to talk about a call to action because it's obviously a problem. And if my grass starts dying because of a it, because of a beetle or a grub or something that's imported from somewhere else, all of a sudden I'm going to be an activist instead of a, a bystander. What do we need to do to prevent that from happening? Well, I believe that most people, being we're in this great state of Utah and we all care so much about our community and the environment and that. I believe that everybody really, most people want to do the right thing and so just the education, the outreach that we're doing here today is a big part of our job to just inform people of the right thing to do and, and people want to do that. How do you impress on somebody how important this is? I think it's important to mention to people because again, people in Utah love to recreate. There are spots that they go where they love because of the beauty and we need to impress upon them if they're transporting firewood or other other pathways that could bring invasive species in, it could effectively destroy those areas that they like to recreate. Potentially in. are bugs more threatening than forest fires? Forest fires? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, I guess it's all relative. I mean, <clears throat> you, do, you would have regeneration, of course, after a fire, so that's considered a natural agent to some degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could be talking about, again, mountain pine beetle and, and spruce beetle. I mean, they devastated thousands and thousands of acres. So what's the, where are the resources? Where can people get involved and do something about this? I would recommend that people uh, do something to educate themselves. There's some wonderful resources online. Uh, mm -hmm. there, don'tmovefirewood.org is one really good one. And another one is our hungrypests.com. Yeah, that's a good time to look at that one is Halloween. That's kind of... That it's pre pretty scary, yeah. A little creepy. But you can learn all about the different pests and whether your area is at risk or not. And more importantly, where to report it if you think you find something. Oh, that's very, that's very good. Um, any resource at the state we should talk about? Uh, Utah.ag.gov. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find our quarantines there, other quarantines that are of an issue, and also a lot of just general information about invasive pests. Okay, extension service. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you find, you're talking about if you find something, report it. So if, if you find something that's uh, bored a hole in your pine tree in your front yard or, or your Certainly elm's starting it. to get sick, can they call extension service? And you yeah, this is out? exactly what I do. I, I work at the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab. And so people are constantly sending samples of, you know, what's killing my tree, et cetera. People can send pictures to my email. They can visit the website. We have hundreds of fact sheets on all sorts of pests. There, there will be some people, like my wife, who would be really <laughs> creeped out about catching a bug and putting it in the mail to you. Sure, so sure. Uh, what, are, what are their avenues? Do you actually make house calls ever if there's uh, something they I, can't get out of a tree? I don't make house calls in particular, but we do have a county-level extension system where uh, sometimes those county agents would make house calls. Or again, you can just take pictures or try to explain it over the phone. Excellent. We're flat out of time. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate this. It's good information. Remember, local government and actions like this are what make your life happen. So be involved, be part of the solution. That's what we're here for on the county seat. We'll see you next week.